Uh, open your Bible to John 15. We're going to continue our series on prayer. I believe God is wanting to stir up prayer in our lives, in the church. You know, I, I totally believe in spiritual warfare. I know there's an enemy. But sometimes you become more aware of the enemy than other times. And I tell you what, since I started this series on prayer, it has been constant warfare in my life. I think I've slept good twice in the last two weeks, and that, which is a little unusual. And uh, I know what it is. I, I know exactly why it's happening. But as we were saying, God wants us to have an effective prayer life, right? He wants us to get answers to prayer when we pray. I was not long ago, actually, meeting with a group of, I hate to say it, pastors who were rationalizing away their ineffectiveness in prayer. And they were saying things like, well, maybe getting answers to prayer isn't really the point. Maybe it's just the process of praying. And I, I think I understood what they were saying. You know, we're connecting with God. But, but in a sense, basically, they were just rationalizing away, rationalizing away the fact that they were not getting answers to prayer. That's not what the Scripture talks about. In fact, the Bible is very clear that God hears our prayer. He wants to answer. He's even glorified when the, when the answer comes. Here's some of these scriptures, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked for of him. Dick Mills says the key to answered prayer is knowing what to pray for. And that's exactly what the scripture says. When we pray according to God's will, then we can have absolute confidence that the answer is on the way. Mark eleven twenty four, Jesus said, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. Jesus said again in Matthew seven eleven, if you then are evil, that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now a lot of people stop at the end of the phrase, give good gifts. Well, God is a good heavenly Father. He's generous, he's loving, and so he just doles out all these good gifts. That's not what the scripture says. He gives good gifts to who? Those who ask. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are, how many chapters you read in your Bible. God's not looking, he's looking for those who are asking in faith. Right? And then John 14, Jesus said, I will do whatever you ask in my name so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And then John 16, Jesus said, very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. And then James 4, 4, you have not because you ask not. There is one word that ap appears in every single one of those verses. You know what that word is? It is the word ask. <laughs> now I realize that there's a span of time between when you ask, you know, the amen and the I have it, as one preacher said. There is a time in between the amen that I have it, the time that you end your prayer, and then the time that you actually receive the answer. And I know that we have to, to stand in faith and persistence, but the bigger picture is God is hearing and God is answering, but we must ask. There are things that we do not have. There are blessings that we have not obtained because we have not asked God for them. He wants to pour them out. He's got a big warehouse in heaven full of everything that you could possibly ever need, and he's waiting to pour them out, but you and I must ask for them before he will give them. I've raised three kids, two of them are in college, one's in high school, and 90% of what they ever got from me, they got because they asked. I did not sit around thinking, well, what new toy can I give my kids when they were this big? No. They, I, they got things because they asked. Now, I, had a, I have a father's heart, and, and I, I, I want to bless my kids. I, I have always wanted to give them what they wanted, but I waited until they asked me so I understood what specifically it was that they wanted. 
Now, when they were three or four years old, I could take them to the dollar store, and for three dollars, I could satisfy every desire of their heart. Oh, for those days to come again. When they got to be teenagers, the price tag went way, way up. Now that they're in college, they're calling me, Dad, can you help me with my rent? How much is your rent? Well, it's $700. Oh, my gosh. Let's go back to the dollar store days. But my, my heart was disposed to bless them. And that's the heart of the Father, but we must do what is required of us, and that is ask. Now, I believe God is wanting to teach us some things about prayer, and that's why we're sharing these, this series on prayer. I know you pray. I know you know how to pray. But how many believe that there are some aspects about prayer that you haven't quite understood yet? There's things that God wants to teach us. Andrew Murray wrote a book many, many years ago, ago called With Christ in the School of Prayer. And I believe that we need to enroll in the school of prayer again. You might want to get that book, by the way. It's a good one. But we need to enroll with Christ in the school of prayer. And we need to say what the disciples said so many years ago. Lord, teach us how to pray. You might have been praying 40 years. There's some things that you can learn about prayer, right? Last two weeks, we looked at... uh, the book of James and the prayer life of Elijah and some things that we can learn about prayer. Today, I want to look at a teaching of Jesus on the topic of prayer, and this is found in John chapter 15. So, again, if you'll open up your phones, your Bibles, tablets to John chapter 15. Now, John's, John chapters 13 through 17 are words that Jesus taught and shared with his disciples the night before that he was crucified. Chapters 13 through 16 likely occurred in that room where they had the Last Supper. Chapter 17 likely occurred in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when he was sharing those words with his disciples. So we want to look at John chapter 15, and I want to read uh, just the first uh, eight verses of this, this chapter today just to get us started. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus is teaching, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser or the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Now Jesus is not teaching a class on master gardening here. He's teaching spiritual lessons about the Christian life and he was a master teacher and he always used analogies of things, physical things that people could could understand concepts that they could grasp. They were gardeners. They were vine uh, dressers, uh, agricultural community. And so they understood these things. And and so he's talking about here a vine. He's talking about branches. And he's talking about a gardener. And he says, the vine is Jesus. And he says, we as followers of Christ, we're the branches. And the heavenly father, he is the gardener. And like a skilled gardener, He will prune those branches that are bearing fruit so that they bear more fruit. And those that are bearing absolutely no fruit, he just cuts them off and throws them away. I like what Bill Johnson said about uh, God's pruning in her life. He said, pruning isn't punishment. I know it doesn't feel very good sometimes when God starts pruning on us. But he said, pruning isn't punishment. It's God helping us reach our potential. Isn't that good? We need to embrace the pruning process. Say, God, just prune away. Prune all you want. If there's dead branches in my life, 
then, then get those shears out and start cutting away and get rid of them because I don't want them in my life. Everything in my life, I want to bear fruit for your glory. There's three main areas that God wants us to bear fruit in. Number one, he wants us to bear fruit in a transformed character. He wants our character to be transformed so that we have the, the character of Christ. Galatians 5 speaks of nine fruit of the Spirit. You know them. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. This is the character of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to reproduce that in us. Does everybody have all the patience that they need? How about all the gentleness that you need? How about all the self-control? So there's room for growth, room for God to prune you so that you will grow more of this fruit in your life. Secondly, he wants us to bear, bear the fruit of souls reached for Christ. God wants us to be witnesses for him and reproduce ourselves in the world. The Bible says that those who win souls are wise. He wants us to win souls and bring the harvest into the kingdom. And then third, he wants us to bear the fruit of answered prayer. How many know that answered prayer is fruit? According to the scripture, I'm going to read this again. John 15, verse 7 and 8, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Listen to this. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. What fruit is he talking about? Well, in the context, he's talking about the fruit of answered prayer. And the, and, and the truth of the matter is that when you ask and you receive from God, it glorifies Him. And that is the fruit of answer prayer. God is glorified when He gets to demonstrate His power through your prayer life and see His kingdom come into situations that need to be changed. That glorifies God. How many know God is not glorified by weak, listless, uh, dull, ineffective prayer that gets no results? I mean, that, that, that does not glorify God. So God gives us two keys here in uh, John 15, 7 to answer prayer. How we can get our prayers answered, here it goes. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done. Key number one to answer prayer, just simply abide in Christ. Just abide in him. The word abide just means to make some place your permanent home. To make some place your permanent home. As believers, our true and permanent home is the kingdom of God, right? It's, it's, not, it's spiritual, it's not, it's not material. I like how Dick Mills paraphrased this verse. He said, if, this is his par paraphrase, if you will settle down in me and all that I represent, and if you will allow my words to settle down in you, then you will be able to ask what you will in confidence and assurance that it will be granted. Isn't that good? But what does it mean for us to abide in Christ? I'm talking about just every day, get up, go to work, deal with your family. God said, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, you can have amazing power in prayer. Whatever you ask for, it'll be done. Well, Lord, what does that mean? How do I actually abide in you? Well, I believe that four things are applied. I'm going to give them to you this morning. It's connection, dependence, continuance, and obedience. Let's take a look at these. Number one, to abide in Christ implies connection. It means having a life-giving connection with the Lord Jesus Christ, being united with him through faith. The, 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 the theologians often talk about union with Christ being united with Christ. And as I said, Jesus was a master teacher and he used everyday concepts to, to help us understand what this means. So he said, in the same way that a grape branch would abide in the vine, stay connected to the vine, he says, I want you to stay connected to me. And it's only as long as the branch stays connected to that vine that the life giving nutrients will flow into it, allowing it to be fruitful, right? How many are gardeners here? You understand this concept. 
And as long as the, the branch stays connected to the vine, fruit will happen. If, you're, if the branch is connected to the, to the vine, that branch does not have to strive for the fruit. It's simply a result of staying connected to the vine. Have you ever walked through a vineyard or a cherry orchard and heard the branches groaning and grunting and striving and sweating to bear fruit? Have you ever heard that? No. They don't have to do that. They simply bear fruit because they stay connected to the vine. They don't even have to make any faith confessions about it. I mean, I've never walked through a vineyard or orchard and just heard the branches saying, I will bear fruit, I can bear fruit, fruit is coming, I confess it in the name of Jesus. No, they just stay connected to the vine and fruit happens. Well, what happens when we get disconnected from the vine? John 15, 4, Jesus said, no branch can bear fruit in itself, it must remain in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Well, I, I got, uh, brought my little uh, props here, my illustrations. This is not a, thank you, this is not a, uh, a vine from a, a vineyard, but here's a, a fairly fruitful, vital, living branch. And we'll consider the big part the vine and the little part the branch. Now, it looks pretty good, right? It's green, it's growing, it's, it's alive. Uh, you can just visualize some fruit coming off of here, perhaps. Now, what happens if I take this off? Let's say this is connected, this is growing. I take it off, I throw it aside. What's going to happen? It's not going to be too long that it's going to look like this branch that's growing off a tree that looks exactly like this out on our property that we need to cut down. Anybody got a chainsaw? We need to <laughs> cut. But you disconnect that. And there's no longer sap flowing in, there's no longer water, there's no longer nutrients flowing in, and in just a short amount of time, this is what the branch is gonna look like. Jesus used this as an analogy. This is exactly what he was teaching. He said this is exactly the same way it works in the spiritual dimension, this is the way it works in your life your spiritual life, your spiritual health, if you get disconnected from the vine, then it's gonna be a short amount of time and you're gonna be looking like this. And the Bible says that they just gather those up and throw them in the fire. They're absolutely useless and good for nothing. Problem is, most people don't recognize when they look like this. The last they thought about it, they look like this. But now they're looking like this and they don't even realize it because it, uh, you know, it's not something that you look in the mirror and, and realize. You know, you can continue to do your job. You can continue to function. You can continue to relate to your family and get involved in, in all your recreation and all, all your pursuits. But you don't realize that if you're cut off from the flow then spiritually you are withering up and looking like that, dead and good for nothing spiritually. You start missing your focus times with the Lord. You start missing those quiet times and you get out of the word of God and you get away from prayer and you actually get away from fellowship because I believe that part of the life-giving nutrients that flow to us happen in fellowship and happen in the body of Christ on Sunday morning and in your small groups and in your prayer groups. There's life that's flowing into you in those situations. There's life that flows in every time you read the Bible. Jesus said, uh, my words are spirit and they are life. You are not going to get life reading People Magazine or Reader's Digest. You might get entertained. You might titillate your intellect. But you are not going to get life from those things. I'm not saying don't read them. I enjoy reading Reader's Digest. Good stories in there. But if I want life, if I want to feed my spirit so that I am green and not dead and not withered, then I got to go to the source and I've got to stay connected. And I got to stay connected to you because you've got some stuff that I need. We are, the Bible says we are a body. 
And, and just like my, my hand needs my arm and my chest and my head and the rest of my body to function, then we need each other to receive life. Just like blood flows through the whole body. Just another analogy. We need one another. Stay connected. Tell your neighbor, stay connected. Now tell your other neighbor. Now how do we stay connected? It's as simple as this. Talk to Jesus every day. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. At the core of staying connected to the vine is simply talking to Jesus. It is so simple that anyone can do it, but it's so simple that many people don't do it. At the, at the core of the Christian life is an ongoing dialogue with the most glorious person that we will ever meet in our life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I believe he has a lot to say to us, but he lets us set the pace of the relationship. This is so important. He allows us to set the pace of the relationship. You can be as close to Jesus as you want to or as far away. It is up to you. I was thinking about this concept and I, I realized, I was thinking about my own kids and I've got three kids and I love them equally, but some of my kids are closer to me than others. And the way that they are closer is they stay connected, they stay in contact, they reach out, they call, they text, we talk and they, they share about what's going on in their life and they share about, uh, you know, their dreams and their visions and, and their struggles that they're going through, and it would be very, very difficult to stay connected with them without that communication. I, I was thinking about my, my own my, my marriage. There are times when my wife and I drift apart. There are times when we feel like we're just two ships passing in the night. She's going her way, I'm going my way. And I guess it's the Holy Spirit or something within me, I begin to realize that, wow, we are, we are kind of feeling disconnected right now. And at the core of that is a lack of communication. At the core of that is a lack of focused time with one another, opening our hearts, sharing our hearts. And so we gotta start planning some date nights and we gotta get some things off of our calendar so we have more time for one another. And that's how we stay connected. And that's how you stay connected in your relationships. I mean, you can't do relationships by osmosis. I mean, we're gonna sleep together in the same bed and we're just gonna relate while we sleep. You know, I mean, just the fact that we're together, just that, man, my heart's gonna go out to yours. I heard some dude talking about that one time, some new age guy, just, you know, you lay, you know, just laying beside each other and my, my spirit comes out of my body into yours and you're, you know, I just think, come on. No, you gotta open your mouth and talk and communicate and dialogue. And that person has to be so important to you that you make time to do it above other things. Because when you make a choice to do one thing, you are making a choice not to do other things. And so if you want to have a good relationship with your family, you got to make a choice to focus time with them. If you want to have a good relationship, stay connected with Jesus, then you got to make a choice to not do other things at times and spend time with Him. Yeah. Amen? Amen. I mean, it's not rocket science. James said, uh, James 4, 8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. I, I believe that when we start a conversation with God, he will continue that conversation as long as we want to until we stop. And then when we start again, he will be there to respond to us. Does that mean God never initiates conversation with us? No, he can't do that if he wants. But primarily, he waits for us to come. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. It kind of just reminded me of a, a, a pastor named D. Duke, who has a church in Jefferson, and he was raised in Trout Lake as a dairy farmer. His dad was a dairy farmer. And he said that while he was growing up, his uncle would come to visit him uh, once a year, once or twice a year. And he always had a pocket full of nickels. And he said, D, every time that you take a few moments, 
and just come and sit with me and talk with me and share what's going on in your life and we can just have some interaction, I will give you one of these nickels. And this was back in the 60s and a nickel, you know, was more than it is now to a <laughs> six, seven, eight-year-old kid. And you could probably buy a loaf of bread for a nickel or 20 cents or something back then. Now it's what, 10 bucks? I don't know what it is. <laughs> I never go to the store, but hardly. So this went on for three or four days, and Dee would come and just spend that few moments. And he, no, a kid, he doesn't want to sit down and talk with an adult. He wants to go out and fish and run with his friends and ride his bike. But man, he wanted those nickels. So he would come and spend a few moments and talk. And after about three days, Dee said, I came up with this wonderful idea, and I shared it with my uncle. I said, uh, you know, instead of me just coming bugging you all the time and taking this time, why don't you just give me all the nickels now, and then I don't have to keep doing this, and it doesn't waste your time. And the uncle said, well, I could do that, but I know if I did, I would never see you again the rest of my visit here. This is the only way I have of having some time with you and having some conversation with you. And D related that to prayer. Um, God wants to answer our prayer, and he can answer all of our needs and meet all of our needs. He knows what we need even before we ask, and he could just meet it. But sometimes the only way that he gets to have a conversation with us is when we come and ask for him for something, you know? Now, as we grow and mature in the Lord, we realize that prayer is more than just asking. Prayer is thanksgiving. Prayer is praise. Prayer is worship. Prayer is just simply fellowship and enjoying his presence. And the, the longer you walk with the Lord, the more of that that you want. In fact, uh, I think it was Bill Johnson that said, if I had only 10 minutes to pray, I would spend eight minutes in worship and praise. That's how important that is. But Sometimes the asking, particularly if you're a younger believer, that's the only thing we know about prayer. And, and Jesus is happy to answer those, and he just wants to interact with us. He just said, come and ask away. You know, a good starting point, I always encourage folks, is just set aside time every single morning. Every morning, set aside time. And, and focus on dialoguing with Jesus, talking with Jesus, opening your heart. I heard one guy said, the first thing that I do when I wake up is I grab my phone and I read the news. Don't do that. The news is going to stay there. Open up your heart to Jesus. Spend those early moments of your day before your mind gets focused on other things. Just talk to Jesus. Talk about your day. Think through your day and say, God, I'm going to be involved in this meeting and I'm not sure what to do or how to handle this situation, but God, I just, I just need your help. Uh, help me to just tune into you. Help me to hear your voice today. Lead and guide me. Minister to my family. Just, just talk to the Lord. Amen? Amen? I recently heard a podcast. In fact, our whole staff watched it uh, where this guy was interviewing Highly successful people, over 200 of them, 200 uh, millionaires, Olympic athletes, entrepreneurs, and out of that, he condensed down 15 secrets of these highly successful people. I'm not going to share all those 15, but one of them was, the, one, one key was how they start their morning, how they start their day. Most people would think, well, they get up and jump into work, or if they're an athlete, jump into working out. No. They said, key, the, 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 the number one key in my day is to carve out 30 to 60 minutes for me to, to minister to my soul, to minister to my spiritual health, to, to get quiet, to reflect, to think, to ponder, to pray. And I thought, man, I mean, these, these highly successful people have discovered one of the most important things you can do is start your day off right. And as a believer, that means starting your day off with Jesus. So just tell your neighbor, man, you need to start your day off with Jesus. Come on. Okay, I got to hurry because we got to spend some time praying at the end. So abide in the vine also implies number two, dependence. Dependence. John 15, 5, apart from me you can do nothing. So without the vine, we've already discovered that the branch is absolutely powerless, lifeless, and it can bear absolutely no Fruit, we're completely dependent on Jesus for everything that counts as spiritual fruit in our life. Number three, continuance. You know, it's not enough 
to have a one-time encounter with God. If we're going to bear fruit, it's not enough to have a mountaintop experience. We have to stay connected to the vine. That's the idea of continuance, and that is actually in the Greek language. If you look up that word abide, is this idea of remaining, continuing, enduring, staying plugged in through the dry times, staying plugged in during those times when you feel like God is a million miles away. Does anybody ever feel that way besides me? I mean, we all have those dry times when it feels like, where are you, God? I'm praying, I pray, and it seems like the words come out of my mouth and fall to the ground, absolutely fruitless and useless. It's times like that that we've got to continue. Just keep doing what you know you need to do, keep in the Word of God, keep praying, keep at it, and stay plugged in. In fact, the NIV re, uh, translates the word abide as remain. We, we just have to endure. Amen? I heard a sad story in the news today about a former, and unfortunately I have to say former, a former pastor and, a, and an author. His name is Joshua Harris. He wrote a book called, uh, back in the 90s, called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It was a best-selling book, sold about 1.2 million books. He has since taken out of publication. He was a pastor of a mega church back in Maryland. In just recent months, he has... Uh, resigned his church, he has divorced his wife, and he has denounced the Christian faith. He said, I am no longer a Christian. I'm no longer a believer. All of his Christian books, he said, I want you to stop all, all publication. He's apologized to the, the gay lesbian community for his biblical stance that he once had on the subject, and he's just made a complete uh, turnaround he announced this on Instagram. He has 22,000 followers. Fox News picked it up, and so it went, went all over the world. And what's sad about that is that he was a very, very fruitful, uh, very fruitful person. He started a ministry um, for single Christians that, that went all over the nation. Like I said, he, he, he was a sought-after conference speaker. But the problem is he did not remain in the vine. I don't know what happened in his life. I don't know if it was something instant. It was probably not. It was more, probably more of a, a progression. It, it, it was probably more like this. You know, here he was at one point, very, very fruitful, alive and vital. But at some point, he began to disconnect from the vine. At some point, he got out of studying, reading, meditating on the Word of God, began to disconnect and disassociate perhaps with fellowship, uh, got to a place where he wasn't opening his heart, being real and transparent with other believers, wasn't confessing his sins and the struggles that he was going on. And so he was disconnected and the enemy got in his life. And so at this point, he's like that dry branch. He is no longer fruitful. Now we pray, I'm gonna pray for Joshua Harris, that God gets a hold of him and turns his heart back to Christ. And we need to, need to pray that. But that's, that's exactly what happens. And then fourth, abiding in the vine implies obedience. You know, it's a popular message today to minimize obedience by magnifying grace. I call it a hyper-grace message. But biblical grace never minimizes obedience. Jesus said obedience to God's commands is essential if we are going to stay connected to him, to the vine. Here's what he said in John 14, 21. Those who accept my commandments and obey them, they're the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Our obedience and love are connected. You can't love God without obeying him. Obedience is an expression of love for Jesus. Now, here's a key number two to answer prayer. Number one, we need to abide in him. Number two, make his words abide in you. I'm almost finished. Having God's words abide in you means having a constant flow of the word of God coming into your life through reading the Bible, through meditating on scripture, studying the Bible, listening to messages online, however you get the word of God, you're letting that word, you're putting yourself in a position where the word of God is flowing into your life. 
It means opening your spiritual ears to hear and obey what God is speaking to you. Listen to what Proverbs 4.20 says. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all of your flesh. How many know there's a lot of words competing for your attention? In fact, uh, one study said we hear somewhere between 30 or 20 and 30,000 words a day. They're, it's coming at us all the time. But if we want to be fruitful in prayer, we are going to have to tune out some of those words and tune in to the Word of God and let those words flow into our lives. Hallelujah. The other thing we need to do, and I'm almost finished here, is we need to guard our hearts against the things that choke out the Word of God once we put it in. Jesus told this parable in Matthew 13, verse 22. He said, the seed falling among the thorns uh, refers to someone who hears the Word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the Word, making it unfruitful. I want to encourage you, don't let the love of this world choke out the word of God that you place in our heart. The enemy will put things in front of our life that glitter and try to get our attention. And we, if we pursue those things at the neglect of God's word, it will literally choke out the word of God in our life. God wants to answer our prayers. He wants us to stay connected to the vine, he wants the word of God flowing in our lives.